Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 13. I want us to... Well, I said 13. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. Let me correct myself. 7. Let's go to 7 and begin reading at verse 13. I knew there was a 13 in there somewhere. Alright? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. We'll begin our reading at verse number 13. Notice the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in this particular passage of Scripture. Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 13, He said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened to a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Let us pray. Father, thank You so much for Your Word. And Lord, I realize and I know that uh, I am just a man. And without you, I can do nothing. And in my own heart, I don't feel like I've had the proper time to really put this together. But Father, when we're weak, you're strong. And God, you can take our infallibilities and you can use them for your glory. So I pray that you'll use a vessel of clay now that I yield to you. And Lord, that you will speak through it words of wisdom that will feed our soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today I want to bring to you a thought that I've titled, Stand for Truth or Fall for Anything. Stand for Truth or Fall for Anything. The year was about 1970 to 1972, and a popular saying uh, began to spread across this great land called the United States of America. And that saying was simply this, if it feels good, just go ahead and do it. If it feels good, just go ahead and do it. Now I want you to understand that today we hear this same mentality expressed in sentiments like this. What's truth for you may not be truth for me. Did you get that? What's truth 
for you may not be truth for me. The saying has so thoroughly saturated our culture that our nation has begun to be known as a nation of tolerance. Now, tolerance today does not merely mean that you accept another person for who they are. Oh no, no indeed. Today's term for tolerance means that you must affirm and endorse people's values and behaviors as well if not you are a bigot or you're some malicious creature if you don't do it. Am I telling you the truth this morning? If the Lord Jesus teaching would be judged in our nation today by the standards that we see going on in this nation, he would be one of the most intolerant, politically incorrect, fundamental extremists who ever walked the face of the earth. That's what our people would say about Jesus today. In fact, our people would say that he was dogmatic and subscribe to the idea that there are absolute standards of right and wrong. Well, I got news for you today. They are standards of right and wrong. Amen. There are things that are right and then there are things that are wrong. We're living in a day today, my friend, whenever we try to take what's wrong and make it right and what's right and make it wrong. That's where the standards of our nation has gone today. Now there are several things that I want to bring to your attention with this thought in mind. Stand for the truth or fall for anything. First of all, I want you to notice that I believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ rejected relativism. Now that's a $5 word. And my $2 mind don't understand it, so I want to try to tell you what I'm talking about. Whenever I mention relativism, I'm talking about the doctrine of, of knowledge and truth, the moral, or the morality rather, the morality uh, that exists in a relation to a culture, a society, or historical context uh, that are not absolute. Listen, Jesus would throw relativism out the window. He wouldn't have anything to do with it. But yet we live in a society that tries to say, you're okay, so I'm okay. Let me tell you something. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not okay. You're not. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, one can enter God's kingdom only through a narrow gate. Now, <laughs> I think we try to widen the gate just a little bit. Amen? Amen? I think that we're living in a society that tries to make the gate so wide that anybody's religion is okay. But you know what Jesus said? He said this. Jesus said, neither is there salvation in any other. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said that. Listen, that's His words. That's not my word. That's the Lord's word. And there is no other way that you'll ever be able to be or enter into God's kingdom. Listen, the highway to hell is broad. And its gate is wide. And the Bible teaches us that it leads to destruction. And many people choose to walk the easy way in life. Let me tell you something. I like to live an easy life. It's an easy thing to do easy things. <laughs> Amen? Amen? It's an easy thing to, to walk the easy, easy path. But let me tell you something. It's not an easy thing to walk godly in Christ Jesus. Listen, the gateway to life, true life, is small and the road is narrow. And Jesus says, few there be that find it. Now whenever I begin to think about this, many resent the fact that the New Testament has only one plan of salvation. One plan. 
We try to make many plans. Let me tell you something. I had a Baptist man. Listen, a man who had been a Baptist all his life to look at me and when, when some of these other movements begin to, to creep into the... You know, you know, you still we'd go across the, the, the big pond, the ocean. We'd go across the sea into the homeland of these other people who are now living in our homeland. We used to send missionaries over there to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now the world, instead of going to the world, the world has moved to us. Man, the world is all around us. I'm talking about every nationality that you can begin to think of has moved into the United States of America. And not only have they moved into our country, but they brought their gods with them. And you see, I met a man, and I could call his name, and many of you probably know him, but I'm not going to do that. But I met a Baptist man who was a member of a Baptist church, and he said to me, he said, Preacher, you know, since all of these other people have begun to come into our country, and they're bringing their, their religions with them, he said, I've come to believe that that, that there's, there, there's more than one way to heaven, don't you? Boy, he made a mistake when he said, don't you? <laughs> because I said, oh no, I don't. Jesus said, I'm the way. Jesus said, I'm the truth. Jesus said, I'm the life. Acts 2.38, neither is there any salvation in any other. Well, there's no other name given among men whereby we can be saved. It's Jesus. Jesus is the door. In other words, all belief systems are not equally valid. Did you hear me? As far as Jesus is concerned, there's only one way. And that is His way. That is His way. You see, every other path, every other religion, Every other philosophy or every other belief system leads to destruction. And few there will be that will find their way to real, true, and everlasting life. Now listen, if there is no absolute moral standard, then one cannot say in a final sense that anything's wrong and right. But there is a moral standard. By absolute we mean, my friend, that which applies to all people which provides a final or an ultimate standard. And God has given us a standard to live by. There must be an absolute. And if there are, no, if there are to be morals, there's got to be an absolute. And that absolute is Jesus. If you love me, he said, keep my commandments. But you see, we're living in a society of conflicting opinions. Now don't misunderstand me when I say this, because I use social media. In fact, just about every preacher of the gospel today, if they're trying to get a message across to the world, they use social media today. It's about the only way that you can get the message of Jesus Christ to the world. And while Facebook can be good, there's a lot of negative to Facebook as well. And my brother brought out some of that negativism. Lightning struck the steeple of a church in our fair city uh, out in the county. And negative people said, well, it ought to just went ahead and burnt the church down. But that's all right. They've been trying to burn Jesus down for thousands of years. And He's still just as strong as He's ever been. And uh, you know, it's easy for us to, to get our eyes on those type of statements. And the only reason that the devil allows those types of statements to be made is because he's trying to demoralize you. He's trying to spread that negativism in you. And he can't do it unless you let him do it. And yes, it ought to break our heart. It ought to bring tears to our eyes that society has stooped that low. But let me tell you something. 
Jesus is still Lord if the church had a burnt down. I guess I should have said burned down. But if it had, he'd still be Lord. Let me tell you something. If, if lightning hit this church and destroyed it, we'd still carry on. Amen. You know why? Because we love the Savior. And it don't matter what people may think about us or say about us. We're going to just love Jesus anyway. But people are going to always try to take the anchor away from us. But they can't take our anchor. Because we serve an anchor that holds. And that anchor is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our anchor and Jesus holds. In a world that regards all values and belief systems and lifestyles and, and truth claims of, uh, as, equal, as equally valid, there can only be one universal truth and that's Jesus not tolerance Jesus I don't have to tolerate somebody that's going to sin and I live in a free country I can love them and not tolerate them <laughs> amen I can move on I mean I've had to deal with people in what I do that would basically say to me, there is no God. I shared the story with you. I had a man to look at me one day and say, you're a fool. And I said, well, my Bible says you're the fool. He said, you calling me a fool? I said, oh, no, sir. I'm not. I love you. I would never call you a fool. I said, but God did. <laughs> God did. The Bible says a fool is said in his heart, there's no God. Hey, I believe there is a God. How many of you believe there's a God? Hey, hallelujah. Everybody raise their hands. That's good. Hey, if tolerance is the cardinal virtue and the soul absolute, then listen to me. There can be only one evil, and that's intolerance. And that's exactly the attitude we see upon the proponents of this new tolerance. Everything's going to be all right. You're okay, I'm okay. If you don't have Jesus in your heart and in your life, you're not okay. Now, listen to me. You have an opportunity to make a choice. So the second thing I want you to see is the choice. The choice. Stand for the truth or fall for anything. We're seeing more and more of what I call permission seekers. Permission seekers. They try to find what the Bible does not say and seek to exploit it to give to them a license to sin. Now, they're known by their frequent character uh, and they're known by being chapter and verse people who demand and refuse to learn true biblical principles. Now hear me when I say this. You can take the Bible and you can make it make everything okay if you take the Scripture out of its context. You can. You can take the Bible and make people think that it's alright to murder if you take the Scripture out of its context. You can take the Word of God and you can make people think that uh, the disciples rode around in a Honda automobile and there wasn't even no automobiles being created in that day. What are you talking about, preacher? The Bible says they all were in one accord. <laughs> huh? And listen, how many of you remember the old motorcycle, the Triumph? Anybody remember the Triumph? Their Triumph was known all over Israel. They rode motorcycles in the biblical day. No, uh-uh. They didn't ride motorcycles. There wasn't even a motorcycle around. And I believe the Lord had enough sense that He'd had them on four wheels instead of two. God forbid that I should hurt anybody's feelings about motorcycles. Ed, I wasn't talking about you there, brother. I want you to know that. Didn't, <laughs> didn't mean to, brother. Didn't mean to. Hey, I had a friend of mine said, Brother Danny, you need to get you a motorcycle. I said, Brother, I ride on four wheels. He said, they make them too. I said, I ride with a cab over me. 
Hallelujah. Now, the devil is an arch deceiver. Let me tell you something. Stand for the truth or you'll fall for the deceptions of Satan. Now I want to give you the strategy of the devil's deception. Number one. There are four of them. Number one. The devil distorts what God says by changing the emphasis. You remember when Jesus was being tempted by Satan. Jesus would always come back what Satan was saying by the term, it is written. You remember that? How many of you remember that? All right. Hands up all over the building. Everybody remembers that. How many of you also remember that Satan came back one time and this is what he said to Jesus when he told him to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple? What did, the, what did the devil say to Jesus? If you're really who you say you are, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. If you're really who you say you are, you just go ahead and throw yourself off this temple for it is written. You see how the devil tries to distort the Word of God? It is written that he'll give his angels charge over you to protect you. And Jesus says, but it's also written. <laughs> you see, Jesus took it in its context. Jesus said, it's also written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, let me tell you something. I believe with all my heart God could send angels and take care of me. Hey, I, I believe in angels. I believe in guardian angels. Hey, I've had some things to happen in my life. If I hadn't been an angel present, I'd be dead right now. I would. But God sent His guardian angel to protect me. And I believe in that. Amen? I do. I believe in that. And hear me when I say this. I believe that God could take care of me. But I'm not going to listen to a voice that tells me to go stand on I-75 in front of an 18-wheeler making 90 miles an hour. Well, I, I suppose. I mean, some of them will go around me sometimes. They feel like they're going that fast and throw my hands up and say, God give you angels charge over me to protect me. I'm not going to do that. You know why I'm not going to do that? Because I believe Jesus over what Satan said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I'm just not going to do that. Okay. So he distorts what God's Word says by changing the emphasis on God's Word. Now the second thing that he'll do in his strategy to deceive is to bring into question God's motives. You see, God has a motive for what he is saying. Always, Satan wants to always twist the motive. Twist the meaning. The third thing that Satan wants to do is introduce reason that ultimately leads you to question God's goodness and integrity. God's good no matter what you think. Amen. God's a God of integrity no matter what you think. And the fourth thing that the devil will do in trying to, hit, to use his strategies of deception on you is to thrive on logic as being supreme authority. Let me tell you something. It don't matter whether it's logical in a man's mind or not. God's Word is the supreme authority. And if God said don't do it, that's what He meant. That's exactly what He meant. Don't do it. Now listen to me. Once Satan does all of this accompanied uh, by his constantly trying to destroy you, it's easy to turn and to put off God's authoritative way of living. It's easy. It is. You see, one of, the, one of the biggest lies that Satan has ever said to any of us as children of God is go ahead and do it. It'll be all right. You've got plenty of time. You've got plenty of time. Just go ahead and live your life and enjoy your life. You've got plenty of time. But see, the Scripture says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, 
for thou knowest not what a day may bring. Hey, I've shared the story with you. Hey, I'm seeing 70 people right now. 70. My caseload is up to 70. People dying. Day by day. And when I say I'm seeing 70 people, I'm seeing 70 terminally ill people. And I have to see them at least one time a month. Try to see them twice a month. I'm seeing 70. And a lot of times, some of those 70 will look at me and say, Brother Danny, you know, I know I'm, I'm dying. I know I don't have long for this world. Brother Danny, if, if something happens to me, would you help with my funeral? Will, will, will you help with my funeral? You know what I always tell those people? This is what I always say to them. I'll be glad to help with your service if you don't have to attend mine. Because I don't know that I'll be here when you die. I just don't know. Because see, we're not guaranteed. Brother, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for asking prayer for my, my strength and my health. And I do deal with some very emotional cases. I, I do, I do. It, it, it's heartbreaking. And I know, listen, I live this every day and I know you may get tired of hearing it from the pulpit, but I can't help it. That's what, you have to hear what I live in, okay? But let me tell you something. The biggest prayer I need from you is not only for strength, but God will give me traveling liberties because I travel now more than I've ever traveled to go to see these individuals. So pray that God will keep me safe on the roads because I'm going to tell you what, there's some folks out there you have to watch when they're driving. I want you, <laughs> I want you to know that. I do. <laughs> Brother, that's sinful right there. Now, borrow your motorcycle. That's sinful. But listen, God wants us to be obedient to His Word. He does. Deception is to mislead by giving distorted impression or a false sense of reality. In fact, the Greeks used the word to describe pleasure that comes from watching the theater. Deception is being pacified, my friend, by unreality. Pain and confusion result from trusting false promises or believing a lie. But the third and last thing I want you to see in this is the Father's will. You see, God has a perfect will for your life. Every one of you. He's got a perfect will for your life. Now listen, I want to give you a good, good illustration of this. A good old fella had a couple of sons. And he was preparing his last will and his testament for his sons. There were three boys. And so the three boys read the will after their father had died. And he left three specific instructions for the boys. Number one, they were to sell 40 acres of their ground in another country to cover the cost of his burial. 40 acres apiece. Number two, they were to take some of the money to dig another well on the farm so they'd have enough water to water the cattle. And number three, there was to buy his headstone memorial from a stonemason in a neighboring town that was a personal friend of his. Well, the sons went back and they, they, they thought about all that had been going on. They, they looked over those 40 acres in the next country and they all agreed that, that their father was right. It was a wise thing to sell the 40 acres apiece. So they, they sold the land. It was a property that hadn't produced a good crop in a long time and Really wasn't good for nothing, so they sold the land. And so then they took a look at the well that had been on the property for so long, and they said, well, you know, Papa's right. This old well's been here a long time. We need to go ahead and dig a new well. So they dug a new well, a deeper well, and they agreed that their dad had been very wise by telling them to do so. And so after selling the 40 acres, after digging the new well, they went to the neighboring town, and they priced a monument headstone for their father's grave. And they all three got themselves together and says, you know, 
I said, that's a little bit too much for that headstone. I said, I tell you what we'll do. I said, we'll, we'll, we'll go to a, to a bigger town and we'll, we'll get another price. And so they did. And the other town was a whole lot cheaper. And so they bought the headstone from the other town instead of their papa's friend. Now the question. The father left his son three requests. The question. Did the sons obey their father? Did they obey their father? Well, two counts out of three, they did. But you see, they didn't really obey their father. Because when their fathers died, or when their father died, he told them exactly to the letter what he wanted, and they didn't follow to the letter their their father's wishes. And that's exactly what the devil is trying to get us to do today. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He didn't say keep them if you want to. He didn't say keep certain ones and write off the other ones. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now listen to me. To complete the will of the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, we must do exactly what He said. We must do exactly what He said to follow the Father's will. Now, real quickly, I want to give you an A to Z. Would that be all right? A to Z. When you stand for truth, you don't fall for anything. When you stand for truth, you A, you activate God's power. When you stand for truth, B, you beckon God's presence. When you stand for truth, you converse to the Father's ear. When you stand for truth, you develop godly living. When you stand for the truth, you're empowered by the might of God. When you stand for the truth, you facilitate God's moving spirit in your life. When you stand for the truth, you gleam with God's goodness. When you stand for the truth, you heed to God's commandments. When you stand for the truth, you impart to the world God's knowledge. When you stand for the truth, you joyously live for Him daily so that other people can see His life in you. When you stand for the truth, you keep on keeping on for His glory no matter what. When you stand for the truth, you learn more about Him every day. Now some of you are looking at me spiritual. Like you've already arrived. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Listen, when you stand for the truth, you make a difference in your world. When you stand for the truth, you nip sin in the bud. Nip it, nip it, nip it in the bud. Hallelujah. When you stand for truth, you overcome the deceptive power of Satan. When you stand for the truth, you prevail over your own self. When you stand for the truth, you have a quality of life that can't be described. When you stand for the truth, you respect yourself and others. When you stand for the truth, you're spiritually walking every day. When you stand for the truth, you have a thrilling life in serving God. When you stand for the truth, you understand what life is all about. When you stand for the truth, you value life. When you stand for the truth, you wrap yourself up in Jesus. When you stand for the truth, sin, you exit out completely. When you stand for the truth, you don't have enough of Him. You yearn for more. And when you stand for truth, you zealously enjoy life. A to Z. But now let me tell you what happens when you don't stand for the truth. When you don't stand for the truth, you abort God's plan. 
When you don't stand for the truth, you belittle the Savior. When you don't stand for the truth, my friend, you, you're, you're in a conflict and a battle against Satan. When you don't, or against God, uh, the battle is Satan winning over God. Whenever you don't stand for the truth, you're deceived. Whenever you don't stand for the truth, you're entrapped. Whenever you don't stand for the truth, you're fractured. When you don't stand for the truth, you're always grudging somebody else and what they have. When you don't stand for the truth, you harass everybody around you. That's exactly what happened on Facebook, brother. Harassment. When you don't stand for the truth, my friend, you're irritating your own self and others. When you don't stand for the truth, you jeopardize true life and what it's all about. When you don't stand for the truth, you kill God's plan for your life. Now preacher, you can't kill God. No, you can't, but you can sure kill His plan for your life by the choice you make. When you don't stand for the truth, you limit God's power. When you don't stand for the truth, you mess up. When you don't stand for the truth, you neglect self and others. When you don't stand for the truth, you're oppressed. When you don't stand for the truth, you pick it against everything that's right. When you don't stand for the truth, you quarrel about everything that's right. When you don't stand for the truth, you rebel and you're a rebellious person. When you don't stand for the truth, you stumble. When you don't stand for the truth, you trample on the blood of Jesus that was shed for your sin. When you don't stand for the truth, you're upset constantly. When you don't stand for the truth, you're violent. When you don't stand for the truth, you're weakened. When you don't stand for the truth, you might as well just admit it. You're just X'd out completely. But I don't know about you. But I choose to stand for the truth. Stand for the truth or you'll believe anything that comes along. Stand with me if you will. Father, I've shared your message. It's yours. Use it for your glory now in Jesus' name. Amen.